the numbers stopped growing at an exponential pace. So we'll go ahead and uh, get started. First off, uh, thank you guys for joining us on a new NAFTA, uh, the United States, Mexico, Canada, new free trade agreement. Um, with me today, I have a couple of friends. Uh, we have Tiffany Melvin, who's the president for the North American Strategy for Competitiveness, or NASCO. And we have Dan Utso from Dickinson Wright. And so as we go through today, Tiffany and Dan are going to give us a little bit of insight onto what, what they've been seeing as far as where um, I'm going to still call it NAFTA because I can't quite figure out and remember to say USMCA the right way. Um, where, where it's going, where do they think it's going, and then uh, open it up here for about the last hopefully half hour or so for you guys to go ahead and ask questions. Um, it, if you want to ask questions, there is a little uh, should be a little box you can type your questions in. Please feel free to send them throughout the presentation. Uh, once we get done, I will start to work through them and get them asked to the experts. Um, so with that, thank you guys again. And why don't we um, get going? And the first thing I'm going to do is turn it over to Tiffany. Tiffany, why don't you uh, take us away? Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So as Adam mentioned, I'm the president of North American Strategy for Competitiveness. And we were founded back in 1994, right about the time that the first NAFTA was enacted. And so our organization has been working on North American issues for 25 years now. Um, and I've been asked today to kind of set the stage for North America, talk a little bit about the success that NAFTA has had, give you some interesting statistics and show you some cool graphics that kind of help explain things. And then I'm going to turn it over to Dan to talk about where we stand with the USMCA, or the CUSMA if you're in Canada, or the TMEC if you're in Mexico. Each country puts their country first, so it makes it even more confusing than just the USMCA acronym alone. Um, but NAFTA was signed in 1994. It was a really groundbreaking trade agreement because it was countries with different levels of development that established a free trade agreement between themselves. And it was the first commercial agreement that incorporated various topics like services, foreign investment, protection of intellectual property rights, government purchases, and dispute resolution. So the world was kind of watching, and it has been tremendously successful for our three countries, although it does get a lot of bad press in the media sometimes, and there's a lot of bad information out there about North America. Um, so I'm hoping to kind of help you know, set the record straight. I think most of this audience is probably knows that, and you do business in North America, which is why you've tuned in. Um, but I think this graphic is a really good one. Um, you know, trade, you, trade with Canada and Mexico supports millions of US jobs, uh, about 14 million and, and counting. Uh, about 5 million of those are related directly with trade with Mexico and about 9 million of them are related directly with uh, trade with Canada. So 49 US states count Canada or Mexico as one of their top three merchandise export markets. So this graphic is showing, you know, there's a lot of China out there but Mexico and or Canada fall in the, like the number two or number three with most of those states. And then you see Mexico largely in the south, and then you see Canada largely in the north. Um, but the trade with um, Canada and Mexico, U.S. trade with Canada and Mexico, since NAFTA has quadrupled in the past 25 years, it's reached nearly $1.3 trillion annually. That was a 2017 number. Um, it's been really good for manufacturing. Most U.S. manufacturing sectors um, 38 out of 42, actually, and most states, about 46 out of 50, count Canada or Mexico as their first or second largest foreign purchasers. Um, and Adam, will you go back to that slide, just one back, because they look a whole lot alike. But this is, so the first slide, that one's with importing, U.S. imports, and then the next slide is with our export partners. And check this out. You've got Mexico in the south, a ton of Canada. Um, and then you've got Nevada. I always laugh about Nevada and Switzerland. I don't know what's going on there, but um, uh, but the, it's all that money from Vegas going. <laughs> going back to the Swiss so, bank accounts. I guess so. Um, and so, for farmers and ranchers, you hear a lot about the ag industry and them kind of saving saving uh, the the USMCA negotiations. But almost a third of U.S. agricultural exports went to Canada or Mexico in 2017. That's a ton. The service economy, you hear about trade and services a lot, and, and that's a new kind of uh, focal point of the USMCA. But U.S. service exports to Canada and Mexico tripled, um, about $27 billion in 1993 to about $91 billion in 2017. 
And I know this is a lot of statistics and numbers, but they really are pretty staggering and they go straight to the heart of why it is so important to save this trilateral free trade agreement. Um, and then of course with small businesses, Canada and Mexico are the top two export destinations for US small and medium sized enterprises. Um, so there, so na next slide please, Adam. So when you hear NAFTA mentioned, you often hear part of the negative NAFTA comments are about how uh, NAFTA has been the cause of, of many, many job losses to Mexico or to Canada from the US. Um, and it, it was in part responsible for some job losses, but um, people, but the most of the, the job losses that have been, uh, I guess, incurred from the time that NAFTA was enacted until now are really because of advances in autom uh, automation and uh, kind of robotics in the manufacturing industry and they're replacing people. And that's the real reason these advances in automation and technology um, have displaced a lot of workers. Um, but a number that a lot of people don't talk about is the job retention numbers. And this one really kind of surprised me as we kind of have gone through the past couple of years of, of renegotiating NAFTA in that when the time that NAFTA was enacted in 1994, a lot of companies were considering closing up shop entirely in the US and moving their, their operations to Asia. And because of NAFTA, many of those companies were able to keep their operations in the U.S. open and, and open additional ones in Mexico and Canada, but retained those jobs in the U.S. And so a great example of how integrated our supply chain is, is the auto parts. Um, auto parts travel across the border at least eight times, some up to 10, I've even heard 12 times across both borders, the U.S. northern border with Canada and the U.S. southern border with Mexico. So we kind of make a joke that they're citizens from North America. There aren't Mexican cars, there aren't Canadian cars, there aren't USA cars, there's North American cars. And this happens across multiple industries, not just the auto industry, although that is a major one. And so a really interesting fact that I have is that 25 cents out of every dollar of goods that are imported from Canada to the United States are made in USA content, meaning that 25 cents of every dollar, we've made something in the US, we've sent it to Canada, they've enhanced it in some way, shape or form, and we're importing it back to the US. But 25 cents of that is made in the USA content. And 40 cents of every dollar coming from Mexico, being imported from Mexico to the United States is, is USA content, 40 cents of every dollar. So those are really impressive numbers about how our supply, and they, they really go straight to the point of how integrated our supply chains are. Um, Next slide, please, Adam. So at NASCO, we've been working on these issues for, like I said, 25 years. Um, we're a nonprofit organization. Uh, we have three main focus areas. It's supply chain and logistics, energy and the environment, and closing the skilled workforce gap. So we work on advocacy, of course, for North America, uh, for the three main focus areas, but we also do pilot projects internally with our organization. We try to test out solutions uh, become a big voice for technology-based solutions for improving freight movements in North America. Um, we've done a couple of reports. We've done a U.S.-Canada border report and a U.S.-Mexico border report uh, with really trying to identify realistic, tangible, common sense solutions for how we can move things forward um, at the borders, not to compete with any border organization that's out there, but just to enhance uh, what's already happening at the borders. And we do events and we do webinars like this for our members. Um, but our, our, our key point these days is that while all of this fighting is going on at the federal policy level, the federal trade policy level, out in the grassroots, the companies, you guys on the phone, the companies, the local communities, local governments, this is where the action is happening. And there is so much opportunity for us to move North America forward and improve our competitiveness in the global marketplace, um, despite what's happening at the federal trade policy level. Of course, these trade agreements are, um, are important, critical, vital platforms for business to do business in all three countries. Um, but while the fighting is going on, uh, I guess the key point I want to make is just there's a lot of stuff we can do with borders and with workforce training and talking about automation and workforce and how to retrain workers to be able to handle the robotics and the automation. There's so much that we can do while this is being hammered out. So I don't want people to be all doom and gloom about North America these days. There's a lot of great things happening, a lot of great organizations out there, and um, so we're happy to be working with all of you. And with that, I think that I will turn it over to Dan. I think the next slide is where Dan picks up to start talking about the new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement and all the exciting things happening with it. So, Dan, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Tiffany, and, and good afternoon, everybody. 
Uh, again, I'm Dan Uto with Dickinson Wright. Dickinson Wright is a law firm, as some of you know, that was founded back in Detroit in the 1870s. Uh, the firm incorporated Chrysler, now FCA. So a lot of our work is in the automotive advanced manufacturing sector, but we do we have Silicon Valley offices, Austin, Texas offices, Vegas, Reno. We have 50 offices, or excuse me, 20 offices and 500 lawyers, um, and, and all across sectors. So we have, we're also one of the few law firms that has full service operations in Canada, uh, and we do a great deal of work in Mexico. And so um, USMCA, as, as Tiffany mentioned, it goes by multiple names. Uh, TMEC in Mexico, Cosma in uh, in Canada. What, but I'm 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 aligned with Adam. I mostly say New NAFTA most of the time. Um, but in a special debt of gratitude to uh, to Scarborough for for today for for the invitation to be with you all today. Um, just very quickly, as you know uh, by now that the USMCA was signed on November 30th, uh, getting it just in be, at the last uh, moments there before. Um, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador took over in Mexico as president, so the idea was the old regime um, could sign it, and then the new regime has the responsibility to get it ratified in Mexico, um, which is very similar to what Bush and Presidents Bush and Clinton did back in '94. So you can basically blame the other person as, as uh, for for what's happened. Um, there is just right now, just in terms of a broad overview, one thing that is looming out there is will the president trigger the withdrawal provision of the current NAFTA, uh, which would start a six month clock um, that the current NAFTA would be in place. Some, the operating assumption for many of us was that the president would sign that, start that clock um, at some point, maybe when this is presented to Congress. Um, however, I think there's been enough pushback from members of Congress and others to think that that would backfire um, so the idea was originally you will either get the new NAFTA or no NAFTA. We actually think right now um, it's it's highly likely scenario for all of you planning out there. We'll either have the existing NAFTA, which we are in right now until the new NAFTA is ratified, or the new NAFTA. There's not going to be a gap between the two. There may be a lot of noise that you hear in that vein, but we just think, A, the president, I think, is less likely to sign the withdrawal order now starting that six month clock. But even if he does, don't panic because there's a number of things that have to happen before that time runs out. Congress may step in, there'll be litigation, et cetera. So uh, I think you can reasonably be assured for most of 2019 that you'll either be in a current NAFTA or new NAFTA scenario and likely into 2020. I'll just note, we'll talk more about this in just a moment, that one of the big debates of, of during the, the USMCA process was whether we'll have a sunset clause. The U.S. originally said, well, how about three years or maybe five years in the new, or after five years, the new NAFTA will automatically terminate unless renewed by the parties, meaning we would have to go through this process every five years. Uh, we've flipped it around a little bit. The countries will review the new agreement uh, in six years after it's ratified by the three countries. And if there are any problems, they'll then have 10 years to fix it. So once this is ratified, we basically get 16 years, and then there'll be a review process. Next slide, please. And then looking ahead, so you know the big issue now that everybody wants to know is what's the likelihood, and, and when will this all happen? If you can see, there's really three phases under our statutory law in the United States. We've just completed all of that area in the black that's landed on the agreement being signed. We're in the green part right now on this chart. Um, and what we are waiting for is that dot right smack dab in the middle, which is the 105 days when the um, US International Trade Commission will produce a report that's an economic impact assessment. That report, if you're doing the math at home, was due um, in the middle of March. Uh, but because of the government shutdown, it's been delayed. The deadline is April 19th. Um, the, the common conventional wisdom is that the ITC will use every day possible. Um, so April 19th is Good Friday. For those of you that practice such things, there may be some symbolism in there. It's also my birthday, by the way. Um, so we're, we think that nothing will happen until uh, about the middle of April. Congress isn't going to do anything until they get that report. And then what happens is that there are, then the bills are introduced into Congress. Uh, and the, if, if we worked right on time, if this kept schedule, 
uh, it would be tw about 20 weeks later that we would see. So sometime in the fall, about mid-September, the question out there is, will we be on time? Um, and the, I think the overwhelming consensus is there is no way we're going to be on time. This is a Congress that in the U.S. that hasn't kept the lights on um, for the first part of 2019. So I think the idea that we'll get a trade deal passed, that being said, there's a lot of energy and activity around that. Next slide, please. So as I said just a moment ago, um, April 19th is the money date. Um, we're also waiting for uh, Mexico as part of the USMCA was required to pass uh, its domestic labor reform. Mexico had domestic labor reforms pending that were ready um, dealing with unions and collective bargaining and elsewhere um, that were basically slowed down dating back to 2017. A requirement in the USMCA was that those were supposed to be passed by January 1st of 19. That obviously hasn't happened yet, but it is under consideration as we speak. We expect that to be done. And the, and the idea there is Mexico has to do what, um, the, what the other parties ask for before the U.S. will even consider this legislation because the big issues on the table for Congress, and I've listed them there, are labor, labor, labor. Uh, U.S. Trade Representative Lighthizer was in Detroit this week meeting with um, the UAW, uh, United Auto Workers, and they did not get a thumbs up from that. So labor is still waiting to see where... Oh, I think we may have lost Dan there for a second. Um, sorry, guys. We're on him time just a bit of uh, technical difficulty here. Um, while we wait for uh, Dan to get connected back in here. Um, there, I think he's. Yeah, I think I'm back. Sorry about that. Sorry, Dan. I was about Sorry. to take over. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no problem. And, and you're welcome to, Tiffany. Feel free to jump in at any time. No, no. Um, you, get, you guys have heard this a few times. So, um, but the big issue, I, I, I may have stopped around labor, um, but pharmaceuticals are a big issue in the new NAFTA um, because of there's patent protection that's been given for pharmaceuticals for 10 years. The most that we've seen even in TPP was eight years. And the, and the downside to that is that the argument is that that will delay generics coming into, uh, into the marketplace and, and arguably raise prescription prices. Pharma's position is we need this patent protection because we front end most of the R&D. And when you consider that many members of Congress, particularly on the Democrat side, were just elected on an affordable prescription drug uh, mantra that this is going to become an issue. Um, environment is always out there, dispute resolution is always out there. And so right now, the conventional wisdom is that we need 40 to 50 Democrats to get yes, uh, and that would include some Republicans. Our number is actually a little bit higher. We think it's about 75 to 85 votes. So most of the next six weeks will be spent trying to get people to stake out positions. Um, there is reported, there's two major coalitions out there, the USMCA coalition and past the USA coalition in, in terms of arguing that, but AFL-CIO, um, Public Citizen and elsewhere are also trying to marshal some of the opposition. And the reality is um, nobody wants to tank the new NAFTA. The idea is because um, that would stick us with the new NAFTA if you're on the Dem side, or excuse me, the existing NAFTA. What the left is trying to do is trying to get more uh, provisions in there on labor, pharma, et cetera. So that's all of that to say it's going to take time. So I think the likelihood that we get on schedule uh, or move as fast as we can is very slim. This will spill into late 2019, early 2020, and then electoral politics take over. Uh, I'm sure somebody's declared today candidacy, uh, just the way, the, the way that we're going right now. But uh, we'll see. So uh, next page. Uh, next slide, please. So as we look ahead, now getting into some of the substance here, oh, I should say as well, Canada, Canada could be ready for passage in March, uh, for those of you worried about timing. Uh, but the, the conventional wisdom was Canada was going to wait uh, until the U.S., but Canada may be doing it earlier because uh, Canada has an election this year, Parliament, uh, the elections in October, and the Parliament uh, rises in June, so there may not be a chance to pass it before noon. Uh, excuse me, before noon, June, <laughs> excuse me. Um, 
So we'll, we'll see what happens there. And then Mexico has said they're going to wait for the U.S., but there's really not a concern yet that this will pass in the Mexican Senate, uh, which would likely occur after the U.S. and Canada did sometime this fall if we ever get there. Uh, so now moving to more of the technical side of things. Next, uh, next slide. So what were the, the major changes for those of you to, to work out for? And I think rather than go through the list of all of the changes, is to really look at what were the priorities. And the argument that the U.S. made coming into this negotiation was that we needed to shut the back door uh, to China. Uh, so, so and, and the back door for China through Canada and Mexico. And so the, the major provisions in there dealing with that were auto rules of origin, which I'll jump, jump into some detail in just this moment, but also dealing with dispute resolution that Canada and Mexico would not bring claims under NAFTA for what the U.S. has done on steel and the 301 intellectual property provisions. So while dispute resolution got a great deal of attention during the negotiations, in terms of practical impact for all of you, there's probably very little. Most of those have stayed the same. Um, the sunset clause I mentioned, which is we'll review every 16 years. We didn't do too much on government procurement by America, except um, as many of you saw, there are new by, there is a new executive order on by America or by American uh, that's worth a read. Uh, and then there are provisions in the new USMCA dealing with state owned enterprises, currency, and also a provision in there that says if any one of the three countries goes and cuts a deal with a non-market economy, meaning China or its proxies, that they have to notify the other two and the other two can back out of the deal and still keep their deal with each other. Um, so the whole idea there is to try to prevent Mexico and, and Canada from dealing with China uh, or doing a trade deal. And the whole idea there is, you know, making sure that North America stays North American. Uh, next slide, please. And so the next set of priorities was to make it as difficult to, to manufacture in Mexico as possible. So obviously the auto rules of origin are important. Um, chapter 11, which was a mechanism in place that if you felt uh, that the U.S. felt encouraged investment in Mexico, that you could uh, bring claims for discriminatory treatment, expropriation, et cetera. Uh, that's been eliminated with respect to Canada. It, it now may only be used with Mexico if you have a government contract and in certain sectors. So the whole idea right there is that the U.S. isn't going to underwrite the political risk of investment in Mexico, labor issues, Dealing with agriculture, the big tomato, the great tomato wars between Florida and Mexico uh, were, were a, a, a priority area. And then rules of origin and, and tariff rate quotas under textiles. So those, those were those fell in. So there was a very Mexico driven target. And this is where we saw most of the action. Uh, next slide, please. And so when we move into some of the more technical side, the automotive uh, aspect had three key areas. How do we make sure that the, the automotive sector remains primarily North American? Secondly, what do we do with auto components that don't comply with the new rules of origin? The default right now, as many of you know, is if you don't comply, it's 2.5 most favored nation uh, percent. And then if the U.S. does put Section 232 auto tariffs on, how could Mexico and Canada have a guarantee? Because as you saw earlier, autos are citizens of North America, so we'd end up shooting our industry in the foot. Just moving ahead, uh, Adam, we can move pretty much on the quick step here now. Uh, so the automotive rules of origin, as many of you saw, have gone from 62.5% at the top line to 75%. Um, there's a new methodology, however. 40% of uh, that labor, the labor component, 40% of the, the labor value content must be made at $16 an hour. Uh, so that doesn't mean that Mexico has to pay $16 an hour. It means that as we're tracing the components through, 40% of the labor value content needs to come from places where we pay $16 an hour. The effect of this is not that we'll see companies lifting up stakes in, from Mexico and moving back to the United States and Canada. What we're seeing already is the auto companies are looking to start sourcing potentially more from, from on the supply chain from Canada and Mexico to bump up those levels and their specific uh, credits for R&D and labor force, et cetera. Additionally, at the um, OEM level, uh, so at the Detroit 3 or Honda or Nissan or whoever, 70% of the steel and aluminum has to be certified from North America. And then if there's a transition phase, if you can move to the next slide, 
where the biggest change for those of you that may be operating in the auto sector is where we largely were looking at a world that had 60 to 62.5 percent and we just had to look at what did not count right so we were always looking around you know would are we at that 40 percent threshold and everything else we're pretty much good and the USMCA actually requires you to now trace virtually every component. Um, so you're gonna to need to be working with Scarborough and others or, or your legal counsel, et cetera, because some parts are identified as core parts, some are principal parts and complementary parts, and that list is detailed in the NAFTA, uh, but you see there's different thresholds. Core parts are at 75, 70% for principal, 65 for complementary. So instead of kind of winging it, as, as we've been all known to do from time to time, uh, as, hey, I know that's coming from North America. You actually need to get down to the part level and see where that is. And that's why it's going to be critical to start preparing for this, but also as the uniform regulations are developed for the USMCA once ratified to pay attention. The biggest question we're getting right now is, wait a minute, I make lamps. Do I have to know where every piece of wire in that, in that headlight or in that tire comes from? Um, because we didn't before. Uh, we kind of knew it was more, but it wasn't enough to make a difference. Now you're going to have to really trace these parts. Um, there's also no deemed, so you know, the electric, electrical components and other things, there's no deemed originating in North America anymore either. So it's very important for your supply chain. Next slide, please, and, and uh, we'll start moving to some of the out of autos into other areas. Uh, as I said earlier, Mexico did get a guarantee, as did Canada, that if you don't comply with the new rule of origin, that a certain level, basically current production and, and some to grow on, will maintain the MFN in case the U.S. ever raises most favored nation, uh, which is rumored to be in the, in the talks. Next slide, please. And then for Section 232, as you know, the U.S. is talking about doing 22 auto tariffs. Um, that report is sitting on the president's desk. He has 90 days uh, in which to decide. So if we start putting 25% on foreign auto uh, imports uh, to the United States, Mexico and Canada are largely going to be exempted to that up to certain thresholds. So they've got a guarantee. And that's also in a side letter, so it doesn't require congressional ratification. So largely the Mexican and Canadian auto industry are safe no matter what the president decides. Next slide, please. Um, looking ahead. Um, now, what are some other areas? A big issue in this was for dairy farmers. Um, dairy farmers uh, that may have issues with Canada, there have been new, um, new, new access grant um, for those that may have, that your companies may be exporting dairy into Canada. It should make it a little bit easier. Um, but the U.S. also gave up some things on sugar and a few other places. Uh, um, so some of the agricultural rules of origin are changed. It's worth, I, I've talked earlier about the drug, uh, the pharmaceutical, uh, the pharmaceutical provisions. And um, steel, the 25% the 232 tariffs on steel, Mexican and Canadian steel do remain in place, notwithstanding um, the fact that we've guaranteed 75% of that in the auto industry. Just a quick note on 232s. We do think the 232s on Mexico and Canada will be resolved uh, sometime this spring. Um, it's not a question if it's a question of when. Canada and Mexico are really pushing for that to happen right now. Uh, but uh, our intelligence is that may stay on a bit longer because that's going to be leveraged in the negotiations with Congress. Uh, next slide, please. For those of you that are moving into other sectors as well that have been impacted, I mentioned Chapter 19 stays, intellectual property. Uh, there's been some modernization in there. Also, for any of you worried about NAFTA's immigration system, it's basically stayed the same. It's, which is kind of a downer because many of us know it's not working very well right now. So TN visas, for example, uh, at the same time, there was a push actually during the negotiations to eliminate NAFTA's um, immigration system. So the ability just to keep what we had was is considered a win in and of itself. Next slide, please. Uh, sunset clause I talked about, concurrency. Next slide after that. Um, Oops, sorry. Nope, you're fine. Next slide. So, and some of the, but some of the things that actually very, receive very little attention, but should be good news stories, digital trade. So for those of you in the e in the e-commerce, we're dealing with technology. There's not going to be tariffs and duties in North America on um, electronic transmission. Some of you likely saw um, that France has just proposed um, a 3% tariff on digital trade. We now have a platinum standard digital trade uh, provision 
um, in, in, um, in the USMCA, which is even stronger than what was in the TPP. De minimis, some of you I know use de minimis thresholds of, of the $800 in the US. One of the big asks for the US was for Canada and Mexico to raise to 800. We didn't get there. And I will note that this is an area that is still arguably being negotiated uh, because what we ended up with in the deal that was signed was basically uh, not a great scenario for anybody because um, yes, Canada and Mexico partly raised their thresholds, but that, that was good news to the retail industry in those countries uh, because it didn't go all the way up to 800. The downside is we now have three different levels of de minimis, which is very difficult um, to administer. So we're going to maybe see some changes on that, maybe aligning the various numbers, because as you can see, one of the interesting pieces is U.S. dollars versus Canadian dollars. So you get the Canadian uh, thresholds in there. So I, I think we may see some movement on that in the coming weeks and months. Um, next slide, please. And mindful of the time here. For those of you that are in the chemicals industry, there are new rules of origin um, for chemicals um, that uh, actually are significant upgrades. As you know, in the past, we used to have to trace basically where every molecule came from. Now it's basically where the product is mixed or produced. Um, so it's a much, so that should be good news for companies working in those sectors or have customers in those sectors. And there's been great news on customs and trade facilitation. Tiffany talked at the outset about the work that NASCO has done on borders. Uh, a lot of that has been incorporated into USMCA. Um, there's a reduced need for certificates of origin. In fact, certificates of origin in certain sectors have been eliminated. Um, there's a strong focus on technology. Uh, this idea where, you know, certain ports of entry, particularly with Mexico, you can only use certain brokers or not. We all know what that was about. That's been eliminated. And for customs audits, particularly with Mexico, this was a big issue um, in terms of us as the business community. All of a sudden, you get a, you know, a letter that Mexico's coming to audit you. Greater transparency in how those audit procedures work, how long record retention needs to be for. And, and when I said focus on technology, too, some of it is you know, where you used to have to submit forms to Mexico and elsewhere in the original with raised seals and all of that, all of that's being eliminated. Again, that's going to take time. So don't walk out of here today saying, hey, I don't need to do what I'm doing with Mexico yet. Uh, but I, I think this is aspirational, but it puts us in the right direction. Next slide, please. Um, other areas of, of uh, I, one of the things that maybe got cut off there is in addition to chemicals, there are new rules on textiles. Um, they largely keep most of the original NAFTA, but for those of you that may be dealing with textiles, fabrics, seat covers, sewing threads, take a look at it. Um, it's largely the same, but there are little nuances in there. Um, so, it, 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 you know, my biggest fear right now is just on this last slide is kind of the three P's is the USMCA has opportunities in it for companies. There's actually a lot of good news in there, but there's also some challenges in terms of compliance. We're doing things a new way. Um, so every company that right now is using NAFTA is going to need to go in and make sure that the existing NAFTA uh, is, is mirrored in the USMCA. And in some places you're going to find it's not. My, I, I hate when the media is putting out there or opponents of the president are saying that this is a rebranding exercise. It, it was not a rebranding exercise. I've gone through every line with my little nerdy highlighters. Uh, about 50 to 55 percent of the current of the USMCA is the same as NAFTA. A lot of the lang new language is borrowed from TPP, but it's not exactly the same. You have to go through and protect yourself. And for those first to market, and also that's going to be important because, frankly, most of us aren't going to be relying on the language and the text of the treaty or the, the, the uh, agreement. What we're going to be relying on is the uniform regs that come out um, at the CFR, uh, what customs deploys. So you're going to need to know where you have potential exposure so that we can help shape that process in the uniform regulation. So some of you have asked, are we going to get some instruction here today on how to fill out forms for the USMCA? The answer is no, because we don't know what those forms will look like. But what you need to do now is be practical. Avoid a lot of political noise. I think we've given you a pretty good framework, but be practical. And by practical, it means be prepared. Uh, it means look in here, see where you have exposure, work with your broker, work with Scarborough, others, and to see where you are. And trying to predict and say, I think the, let, let us do the predicting politically and otherwise, but don't say, hey, I'm going to have time into 2020, 21, 22 to do this, um, because I think you'll get yourself in trouble. The good news is there's enough out there now where you can begin preparing, see where you have exposure, and then uh, your broker or legal counsel, others can take it from there. 
So again, I think there's good news, but there's also going to be some changes for you. And with that, happy to answer any specific questions that you have. Back over to you, Adam. Perfect. Well, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Tiffany. So we've got a couple of questions coming in. Um, I wrote a few things down. So one of the questions and, and one of the things that, that I've seen a, a lot of is there's a lot of conversation. And I'm curious what you both have heard about neither Canada nor Mexico would potentially approve without those Section 232 field tariffs being resolved. Are, are, are you guys hearing the, the same thing? Yes, I, um, yeah. I am. I'm, I'm hearing, yeah, sorry, Dan. I'm hearing that both Canada and Mexico won't move through the process of ratification until the tariffs are list, lifted, and they also want to see what the final U.S. language is, not just in the agreement, but in, in the side letters and the implementing legislation before they move forward. And then uh, Mexico damaged in the labor legislation that's supposed to be passed by January. They're looking at introducing that in February when they come back into session and have it approved by April but then they go on a break and they come back September 1st. So they won't be picking this up until September 1st anyway, mm -hmm. as far as moving the process through their Senate. Dan, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I, I, would, the, I would, I agree 100%. And I have to tell you, it's not just Canada and Mexico, the U.S. members of leadership in the U.S. Yeah. Congress have said they will not take up this deal until the 232s are removed. And so just to expand on that for a second, if you look at now the White House has to go to the Hill and sell this, they've been trying to keep, the 232s as potential leverage where they could go to a reluctant member of Congress and say, hey, you may not like USMCA, but you have a, a manufacturing companies complaining to you about 232s. You have farmers complaining to you. We'll take those off in exchange for your yes vote. So I think conventional wisdom, and I keep using that phrase, but that's about the best we can do right now, was, and, and it was my personal view, is that we would not see these lifted until um, the, the debate in Congress started in May or, or later. Uh, it's also aligned with the president actually thinks that, um, that the tariffs are generating money for their U.S. Treasury from foreign countries. And, and that's just not how it works. It's, we all are paying that. But just a couple of, of added points. One is Canada has tried to accelerate that process because what Canada has said is, hey, we can start in March passing this deal I tell you what, you lift the steel and aluminum tariffs, we'll get this passed before our parliament leaves in June. And then that way, when you go to the Hill, you could say to members of Congress, this deal can't be that bad. The Canadians, and they're a liberal progressive government, they agree with this. Uh, and so that, that was kind of the carrot, the stick that the Canadians were using as, hey, if we don't get this passed by June, we can't guarantee it. So um, let us start our process now by lifting the tariffs and away we go. Uh, the second point, I, I said a couple, I actually put a third one in there too. The second point is Mexico, to Tiffany outlined it perfectly, but Mexico has, is also retooling its retaliation list. Uh, and so some of some, and they're targeting specific influential congressional districts. So Mexico within the next month or so will be rolling out a new retaliation list if these aren't lifted. So companies should be on the alert when that rolls out. Um, and then the third point uh, was, I actually don't remember the third point that I had, but it was it was something decent. I may come back to it on on section 232s, but uh, uh, I, I think that's so. Uh, my my working assumption right now is we'll have 232s in place until. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The third point was China. Uh, if we do have a deal on late March with China, I think it's going to be very difficult to continue to have tariffs on Canada and Mexico, right? The, the argument doesn't hold water. So. Uh, you know, I think we won't see the tariffs lifted until the end of March at the earliest and probably not by spring unless unless there's a deal. Perfect. Thanks, guys. So, Dan, I'm going to take you back to your auto slide here. Um, and we we talk about the the $16 an hour and, you know, kind of enlighten us a little bit because I know there's a lot of conversation around you know, what's actually included in that? Does, does R&D count? Does some of those other items that maybe weren't traditionally counted inside of that NAFTA uh, calculation, that, that regional value content, you know, what's the word or what are you seeing or hearing about, you know, some, some, some of those things that are maybe outside the scope of what most folks would, would usually see when they're trying to figure out, does my product qualify? Sure, yes, and, and a lot of that is spelled out in the text of the agreement itself as to 
what can count. It's actually detailed, and but it's footnoted heavily. So there's a lot of cross-referencing, which all of us in the, the trade and customs world are used to, right? But what at the end of the day, it's it, one thing to remember is this is at the plant level. Um, and so what we're seeing right now, and, and this is why it's important to pay attention to this issue at, at, this, at this time, is the OEMs and tier one suppliers are starting to send out questionnaires, and some of you may have received them already, asking for, uh, we want to know on the line how many, you know, that component we're sourcing from you, what is the, the cost of that component? So it's done by what's called annual purchase value. So we're purchasing this much from you. Uh, of that, that price, how much of that is labor uh, costs? So can you break it down for us uh, by wages? How much of that is R&D cost? Uh, how much of that is, and, and how much of that is sales and marketing? cost. So they're getting very specific because then at the, as the OEMs go to supply, they're going to put it in tier ones, they're going to put it in their matrix and, and figure out how it fits with those, the contours of those, uh, those new requirements. So uh, the best I do for, for you right now, I can summarize a bit, is go in and, and look at the text of the agreement. Uh, and there's very specific provisions on what you can count and what you can't, but you hit the big ones. R&D, and you can see in the slide, there's actually a, a certain percentage that can count uh, for that. Uh, the, the big issue that they didn't want in the deal was um, the, the auto companies saying, well, we're paying the engineers in Detroit 300 or 250 grand or whatever, uh, and those folks are making more than $16 an hour per model and using that. There's a cap on how much you can use. Um, and so at the end of the day, somebody that actually is touching that component has to be making $16 an hour uh, down the supply chain. So if you haven't received the questionnaires and you are supplying the auto parts, look out, they're coming. Um, and it creates some real challenges on how to fill those up because keep in mind, uh, in a lot of our markets, the suppliers are competing with the tier ones and the OEMs for labor uh, and for workforce. And so, and in some cases, if you're, uh, for example, with the Japanese suppliers, uh, because of kind of antitrust, anti-competition rules, the Japanese aren't allowed to share that information with each other. Um, so you get into all kinds of issues there. Uh, what we would recommend is that if you are receiving those questionnaires, talk to your broker, talk to your lawyer, uh, because how you respond to those is really important. And so that, A, that you can give as much information as you need to keep the customer happy, but also uh, that you're not putting yourself in a tricky position with some other, from, with some other rules. Thanks. So kind of along those same lines, you know, we start to look at what's a core part, what's not, you know, ha has there been any murmurings of potentially updating the tariff to say, you know, these tariff numbers constitute core parts, these tariff numbers constitute non-core because ultimately, you know, you, you get into some of that and there probably does leave some room for gray, which is where guys like you make good money. And so how, how exactly does, does, or what maybe are you hearing or seeing that, that may go one way or the other on that? Adam, that's a great question. I mean, it's the most common question. I, I had a meeting with about 80 auto suppliers, our clients earlier this week. Um, I was at the work truck show in Indianapolis yesterday um, with a number of, of companies. And, and that's the major question is, well, wait a minute. I make this, I make this circuit board, I make this, what level of specificity am I going to have? The answer is for the top tier parts, the core parts, 75%, it's pretty clear what they are, right? If you're making the chassis, the transmission, you're in, right? Um, but moving down, I, I agree with you, it's gray area. And actually that gray area isn't where we like to play because, you know, what I, what, makes us successful is your companies are growing and thriving and expanding. If we're spending all our time in compliance, then, then that's not good for anybody. Um, so that will all have to be spelled out in the uniform regulations. The working assumption right now is the methodology that we use for determining RVC or net cost, et cetera, will continue in defining those parts. But I think, Adam, you, you've shown tremendous foresight here. At the end of the day, the customs regs are gonna have to be updated. Right, they're, they're going to have to start listing it out by tariff code class, HDS code, uh, because if they don't, there's going to be, you know, you're just going to see a flood of opinions, requests, mm -hmm. and classification ruling requests coming. So I think, I think the idea now is what 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 we're recommending everybody do 
is if you think you're in one of those tiers with heightened levels, um, and, and virtually everybody will, is to, is to really know what your component is. Know where everything is, know what your exposure is, uh, and just hold that for now uh, until we can see and say, geez, if, if this is gonna be set, or if all of a sudden this pushes me outside where now I have a non-conforming good or I can't rely on NAFTA zero tariffs and start doing that cost benefit, and then we can say, that's an area we need to focus on in the uniform regulations to make sure that your, your component stays in stays in uh, NAFTA compliance or US. Well, and, and what kind of gets really interesting around that is while the president can can claim to, you know, can can do 232, 301, you know, he can't change the tariff as far as the actual HTS number that, that's used. So that in and of itself is a whole separate process, which I think this all gets really interesting when you start to think about it at that level and trying to really update that that tariff for something that's very specific to to NAFTA or USMCA now. Um, right, it's gonna be, is it gonna be eight digit? It's gonna be at the 10 digit level. You know, you get right. into all of those things. Um, yeah, I, I think it's gonna be a, a very tricky scenario. And that's why we're telling people to keep an eye out. I mean, I didn't mention during the main part of the presentation, but uh, whether it's Boston Consulting Group or AutoSoft or Auto Forecast Solutions, you know, the analysts that track the supply chain, their prediction is that roughly 40% of, of auto parts are out of, uh, out of compliance with the new USMCA. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, a, that's a larger number than I thought. Uh, but I, I will say everybody thinks it's workable. It's just how do we get there? And, and that's where there's gonna have to be vigilance on everybody's part here. No, I agree. I, you know, we have a lot of customers that flirt currently with that 62 and a half percent line mm -hmm. that, that they're really having to look at their sourcing today to say, I get that I'm okay today. But when this rolls in and maybe end of 19, probably realistically at the earliest sometime in 2020, how have I already updated my supply chain or have I made the business decision not to? And, and right now that, that's a tough, that's been a tough ask of some of our customers and it's something that we're pushing a lot of them to do because when this happens, when this rolls in and 62 and a half percent doesn't qualify, somebody's done this legwork, right? Someone's gone out, right. someone's doing this legwork. So simply from a running your business standpoint, I, I see a lot of value in, um, you know, connecting with your broker, whether it's us or not, connecting with your trade counsel, you know, really starting to look through some of this because pre preparedness for this is not only a good compliance thing, it's also a good business practice. And I think that's really where, you know, probably a lot of folks on this call who are in that compliance um, world who tend to be a cost center a lot, right? You know, this is where you start to really can show guys your value to, from that perspective to the organization on kind of helping you become potentially more competitive when this switches and push out a competitor who maybe didn't do their due diligence. Um, starting now. I, I would add to that too. That, that is a great point. And I, I think too, is even if you're not caught up, caught up in this, keep in mind that there's going to be vigilance by US CBP and CBSA and, and, and others on this, right? So we're going to see enhanced compliance or enhanced monitoring when USMCA rolls out. So every, you know, the idea that it's just going to be like it is now after we have a, a new set of rules is that there may be some phase ins. Uh, my, my, my view is they'll probably have, like we always do, kind of a, a soft period where mm -hmm. soft enforcement at first, just because it is going to be challenging. But then there's going to be a period where everybody's going to have to be deemed in compliance. And if you're not, you're getting bounced. Um, and, you, and you're going to start that, that cost center component. All of a sudden, you've now triggered um, compliance audits, fees, and all of that. And we all know um, parts, other parts of the company don't necessarily like that. So uh, that's the other part that I think where preparedness comes into play is that there's going to be enhanced enforcement on this. There's no question about that. Absolutely. So um, kind of maybe switching topics a little bit, um, but, but just in general is let's make the assumption everybody signs off at the, by the end of 2019, right? I don't think in all reality it's going to happen, but if we play the hypothetical game here, you know, do we think that 
there are going to be NAFTA form changes. Do we think that stuff signed? You know, I think the simple answer is if you, if all this gets passed and we make the assumption we go hard enforcement October 1, that no, your NAFTA won't be valid anymore because there has been too many changes for you just to blanketly say, yes, this is valid. Um, but beyond just, just that, you know, what are maybe you guys thinking as far as, do you think you're going to see a lot of change? Are we going to get a new NAFTA form? Or, you know, my opinion would probably be more along the lines of the NAFTA form is probably going to stay the same. It's relatively been the same for a long time, right? Um, we, we may see some slight changes, but what are you guys hearing? Well, from my perspective, yeah. we're, we're going to see less forms because the, the whole idea of the customs and trade facilitation chapter was to get away from certificates of origin. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but at the same time, that pushes the re record keeping responsibility um, onto the companies, right? Keeping records for five years, certifying on your purchase. So I think it's going to be less of a required form because the whole goal is to get away from a certificate of origin and make sure that the companies are certifying that. So what there's going to need to be is a whole new set of documents within the company to, to certify origin, right? So that you're going to have to look at your POs, you're going to have to look at your bills of lading and things like that. So for the record keeping aspect, a lot of people are already doing that, but, but you're almost going to have to have many certificates of origin on your own internal company documents, because we just don't know right now, those people at CBP who are tasked with this or in other customs agencies that are tasked with, issuing certificates of origin are now going to be retold and be audit officers, right? They're going to go out and start making sure, because you can't have a system where you say no certificates of origin and then not go out and enforce it, right? And go right. out and do inspections and audits. So uh, I actually think, you know, and, and, and what I've joked with a lot of people, and it's, it's more, it's only half tongue in cheek, is, you know, the, the USMCA is com largely renumbered from from the original NAFTA. So a lot of the forms you're using anyway that refer back to the original NAFTA are just gonna to need to be updated for the new chapters and sections. Um, so uh, I think that's what we're gonna see a lot of right now. So every company's gonna to need to do kind of an internal self-assessment and say, are our docs up to speed? No, absolutely. You know, I, and, and I think really the name of the game is kind of, a, as you touched on in your presentation that rules of origin in many instances are changing. So the assumption cannot be made that if my product qualifies today, my product will qualify once the new agreement comes in. And I, I think that's the gist of it. That's the preparedness that we're talking about. That is just something that that assumption can't be made. And my fear is we have companies wanting to make that assumption already today. And you know, I think that goes back to my prior point of just making sure that everyone is really starting to talk now about this. Um, so we've had a few more questions come in here. One real quick, and I'll, just so you guys can take a drink and breathe for a minute. Um, will we get a link to the recording of this session? Absolutely. Um, once this session's over, uh, we will send out a recording to everybody um, for this session. So another question here is, it, um, I'm just going to read it to you word for word here. It's, I work for a chemical company and create NAFTAs and export docs for export into Canada and Mexico. You know, what are you thinking the effect is going to be um, when exporting U.S. made product into these countries? And I think really it ties back to some of those chemical changes, but maybe you want to just elaborate on that a little bit more, Dan. Yeah, I actually think life may be getting a little easier for you. Um, and now it, it obviously depends on your product. So to just to dovetail off of what Adam said, um, you got, we got to go in, you know, you got to go in and see where your product is on the new rules. Um, you know, you shouldn't take for granted um, if it was NAFTA verifiable before that it is today, uh, that it'll fall under USMCA. Now, I think there's a strong likelihood it will, and I think it's a strong likelihood that life's going to get a lot easier on the documentation process um, because it, you won't have to do the same level of tracing that you did before. And it's likely that you may not even require a certificate of origin uh, anymore. So uh, I, I think for the chemicals industry, coatings industry, et cetera, life may be getting better. There are some exceptions to that. Um, 
um, if you were if you had a really really tough time under the old NAFTA, you're probably still going to have a really really tough time uh, because because there are certain products that I, we didn't address the challenge with uh, oil, uh, wow. some of the condensate used in the natural gas industry. Uh, there's some of that got left out, uh, but I think from 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 other areas, I think this should be good news. And, and for your for, and that question in particular, that is worth somebody. I mean, I think it's worth it to everybody. But I mean, that, hey, man, there's a great opportunity. I, I can come in here and say, hey, we're saving money here because we don't have to keep the same level of compliance. May not be great news for Scarborough, but it's good news for you. Well, well, ultimately, too, I, you know, I kind of liken the idea to this back to when customs updated some of the, the 9801 provisions, right? And, and those US goods returned from having to provide that manufacturer's affidavit up front to saying, well, if we ask for it, you need it. But if not, you don't necessarily have to, you know, I Customs has proven that they've done this in the past. And so I could foresee this potentially going, you know, following that, that same trend. Uh, I think that's a great comparison, actually. You did trigger a thought, though, Adam, when you said that. I don't want to monopolize the time here. But uh, one thing, as you know, there have been a number of U.S. Customs decisions on 98 and a few other things in the 301 and 232 context. So there was, starting in July, a number of customs rulings coming out. Uh, for those of you that may be relying on those, we have been getting word over the last week to 10 days that some of those are going back to headquarters for reconsideration. Um, so if you are relying on some of these new customs rulings that have come out in the last six months, you may want to check. You may uh, for 232, 301, but they also kind of have broader applications. Uh, you may want to go in and check and make sure that that ruling is still is, has not been sent to headquarters. A lot of them have been in the last week to 10 days. So um, just keep an eye on that. Uh, I just, I just it dawned on me when you said uh, 98, uh, because some of those are caught up in that. Absolutely. So, so you know, we've been talking about maybe some of the, the, the paperwork side of, of NAFTA becoming easier, but that brings up a really interesting question too that, that someone asks: Is what does record keeping look like after this? And I think this goes on to it's it's the same conversation that brokers and importers are having with customs already today about ACE, right? We, we went from requiring that paper 7501, that paper documentation to this online platform, but then it's, well, how long do the records have to be kept? What is record keeping at that point? And so that begs the question, in NAFTA, what does that look like now? Yeah, for, from, for me, I, I, my perspective on it is, um, it, it aligns with a lot of the things that Tiffany and NASCO have worked on. Um, the whole idea, I think I'm freezing up, the whole idea behind the customs and trade facilitation chapter was to push the, cut, the, the record keeping to the more electronic environment. And with the elimination of kind of centralized certificates of origin and thing, that's going to push everything back onto the company and everything back onto your, you and your broker. Right, so it just places a primacy on having your house in order. The, the, this this reminds me of a lot of when we did CTPAT and FAST and, and other programs, where uh, the whole idea, even though they're so-called voluntary, um, that the whole idea is to weed out the companies that are not that are not doing it right with brokers, that are not doing it right with record keeping. You know, I, the whole idea is to to get everybody into that electronic environment. Uh, and get everybody into those that have customs compliance programs and those types of things. Because if you don't, you're going to be left out and they're going to come, they're going to come knock on the door. Um, and, and the penalties, as many of you know, are draconian that way. So that, that's how I see it playing out. The onus for record keeping, like it's great news. Hey, no certificates of origin, et cetera. What that means is all that responsibility just got pushed back onto you with, with even greater force than it is today and your broker. So uh, that, that's where that, that the, the pressure comes from. Absolutely. Well, um, I, I'm going to ask this last question to Tiffany to kind of wrap it up. Um, so um, the, the question has come in is, and, and I'd be curious at, at really what you think and, and where NASCO plays into this is, you know, what, if any, are there negative effects um, to U.S. workers of a large trade deficit with Canada and Mexico? Someone just asked this question in. So I, it seemed like it'd be right up your alley, Tiffany. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that it is, but uh, the, I mean, the trade deficits are really, really complex and I'm not an economist, but you know, what I've been hearing is that, 
you know, in different industries or different sectors, you, you may run a trade surplus or a trade deficit. And um, I, don't, I don't know that we are going to be having a large trade deficit um, with Canada or Mexico. It seems like things are growing at a pretty great rate. And um, so I, I really don't know the answer to that. I don't know if Dan wants to, to speak to that at all, but that's, um, I mean, I feel like with the USMCA, it's going to be moving things forward. There's some concerns there with the auto industry and things like that. But I don't really have that kind of the detailed information about the economics of everything. Yeah, I, I think I, I just think trade deficits are a terrible way to measure economic health of an economy. It doesn't work. Uh, at the same time, there were some there were some issues. Think, you know, the reality was Mexico got too good at attracting investment. I think USMCA is fixing some of those problems. And the reality is, if we can get this deal passed between the three countries, North America becomes the hub of trade and investment in the world, uh, given a lot of the uncertainty that we're seeing in places like Europe and Asia and elsewhere. So there's actually a great opportunity here for North America to become the manufacturing hub of the world again. Um, but I just think trade deficits in a world where you have integrated supply chains just don't make sense. Uh, it just doesn't, it doesn't, and, you know, and I'll leave it to the economist to point out the reasons why, but uh, it just doesn't make sense in North America to measure us that way. Yeah, and I, you know, I'll kind of end, end on this and I think you hit the nail on, on the head is we treat deficit as a bad word and I think at some point it's because an accounting person heard the word deficit right and said oh we can't have a deficit and and so I think there's a lot more at play than than just the simple word deficit and what does that actually mean so with that um, we are just a couple of minutes past time and we try to be respectful of everyone's time and so um, I just want to give a big thank you to Tiffany a big thank you to Dan for uh, joining us today and uh, with that, uh, we will bid everybody adieu and have a good day, guys. Thank you, everyone. All right, bye-bye.